Praise the Lord, everybody. I know there's some folks still out in the lobby. They're gathering in. Why don't we stand this morning? Dorothy, it's good to have you with us. Welcome back. We, we, we appreciate you. Appreciate you coming to be with us when you're visiting. And I'm just thrilled that you're here today. So welcome. We always start with prayer. So let's begin today and go before the Lord and ask God's blessing and to prepare our own minds and hearts to receive the word of the Lord today. So let's just ask God to touch us and speak to us today. Lord, we thank you, God, as we gather in your name. We come into this house of worship, into this place of praise, God, to glorify and to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, as we've gathered in your name, that, Lord, you have promised you would be in the midst of us, that your presence would be here. And, God, where your presence is, anything is possible. I pray today, God, that we open our hearts, our minds to you, to your word. Let your word, let your word be that oil of anointing that's poured on our wounds. Let that, or your word today be that seed that bears fruit in our life, I pray. God, we prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord today. Let your hand be upon us, God, we pray. And Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, are all the praise. We exalt your holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. Everybody, God, we give you praise. We worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. A lady had started attending a new church, and she was in the process of making friends in her new church, and one of the ways she thought she would do that to make friends in her church would be to invite folks to dinner, and so she did that. She went around, and she was inviting people, come to dinner, come to dinner, come to dinner, and and uh, uh, she, she got a list of everybody that was coming, and she was all excited about the dinner, so the dinner was going to be the following Sunday after church. And so she uh, went to church and had already made some preparations before she left, and then she'd come home, and she was just slaving around the kitchen, just hurrying everywhere, trying to get the dinner ready so that she could prepare and have the dinner for all of the folks that's coming. And uh, the door, doorbell started ringing, and she started letting people in, and the doorbell kept ringing, and she started kept letting people in, and she was trying to fix the dinner and the doorbell. And all this was going on as she was preparing her dinner and getting everything ready. And dinner time finally came. And uh, all of these people that had come into her house were gathered around the table, and some were sitting over here and over here. And she thought, you know, it would be really nice if I just asked my daughter to say grace uh, over the food. I'll, I'll let her say grace today. And so she looked at her daughter, and she said, honey, we're thrilled to have all these people from our new church here visiting us, and, and we want, to, want you to pray over the food. And the little girl looked up and said, but mommy, what do I say? And, and, the little girl, and the mother looked down at her just as sweet as she could be. She said, oh, honey, just say whatever mommy has said before. And, and, and <laughs> yeah, and so uh, everybody bowed their head, and they were just anxious to hear what this little girl was going to, going to say. And the little girl said, dear God, why in the world do I invite all these people for dinner? <laughs> Be careful what you ask your kids to do. All right. All right, folks, we started a series last Sunday called Recovered. A series called Recovered. I think this is a very important series because we have so many people that deal with so many things in their lives, and, and stuff comes, and, and, and we deal with it, and sometimes things don't go away as fast as they come. Am I right? Sometimes things hold on for a while, then we, we, we have to learn or somehow cope with these things. And sometimes we do well, sometimes we don't do so well. 
Sometimes things are a little hard for us to deal with and to cope with. So we're, we're, we're talking with, about recovering from these things and dealing with these things in, in our lives and, and how we deal with these things in our lives. And, and I'm telling you, I'm so excited. Uh, I, I think I'm more excited now about living for God than I ever have been. I'm more excited uh, about what God is doing. Now, we have, over the past few weeks, have we had some kind of visitation of God uh, in our services, powerful, powerful uh, moves of God that, that God has just opened the heavens and rivers of his spirit has just flown in here and, and or didn't fly in here, kind of a river flows in here, so that's better. A, but, but we've seen God do things and God is doing a work it, it excites me when I see God start doing those things and, and, and moving in our own congregation. Now last week our first lesson uh, we talked about uh, how we have been hurt and sometimes we're carrying baggage from the past and whatever it is but what that we're dealing with but we learned that God is Jehovah Rapha. God is our healer. He, he is our healer and that God wants to heal us. He wants to. God, God desires for us to be made whole. And, and God wants to heal us. So last Sunday we learned that we're broken. We may be broken. There may be some issues or some, some problems that we've held on to. There may be some things that have affected us that we've not got over and we're still dealing with them. And maybe even some of those things we've kind of pressed back, uh, back out, out, of, out of even our sight, but they're still there. We may be broken, but we're fixable. We're fixable. God is able to still heal us. God's able to still touch us. God's able to still help us. And the question today, I suppose, is, is do you want to be healed? We, we've learned that God wants to. We've learned that we are fixable. And, and the question is, do you want to be healed? And that may seem like a silly question uh, to someone that's hurting. And that may seem like a silly question to someone that's dealing with stuff in their life. But it, was, it's not, it wasn't a silly question when the Lord asked the question uh, 2,000 years ago in John chapter 5. So that's where we're going to go to today. We're going to start in John, the fifth chapter. And we're going to start at verse 1 of John chapter 5, and we're going to read a very, uh, you've pro probably heard this story, if you've been in church very long at all, you've probably heard this story somewhere. John chapter 5, the Bible says this, after this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water, Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, laying, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Do you want to be healed? He asked the question, Do you want to be healed? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. 
And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Skip down to verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Wilt thou be made whole? Now, this is probably, this is, this is a tremendous miracle in, in, the ministry, in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, and I say that like there would be one that wasn't tremendous. They're, they were all great. But, but this one stands out to me for some reason. In, in the miracles that, that Jesus did, this is such a powerful report uh, of the power of God in the life of someone who had been afflicted for 38 years, for a long time. This wasn't a sudden sickness that had come up on this man. This was not uh, 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 something that he had had for a couple days. It wasn't the 24-hour flu. This was a 38-year ordeal that this man was dealing with. And, and he was in a place, these people, this wasn't a clinic. This was not a hospital. This was not a doctor's office. These people had already exhausted every possible avenue of healing they they had th this was a, a final place for them they had done everything within their power to try to to be healed and now they find themselves at a place where annually an angel would come down according to scripture and trouble the water and the one person that got in the water would be healed these people were in desperate need. They were withered and hauled and lame and ailing and sickly. And th this was not, I, 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 my wife and I was talking about the pool of Bethesda one time, and she said, as I've been raised in church all my life, and she said, when I thought of the pool of Bethesda, I pictured beautiful blue water. And I pictured all of these ferns hanging around the pool and these beautiful plants hanging around uh, the pool and all of this great stuff. But when you think about really what was there, the, the, the picture of the pool of Bethesda was not one of beauty and rest. It was one of misery. It, it, it was one, I mean, you went in there and these people, you could speak. Smell the stench of rotting flesh. You could, you could see the impact of sickness on the lives of these people. And, and they were there. They were, the Bible said, impotent folk. Impotent is powerless. They were powerless within their own ability to go beyond where they were at this point in their life. They were powerless in their own ways to be able to change anything. And, and this man, it went on to say, he had an infirmity, almost the same definition as impotent in the Greek, uh, malady, a sickness of the body or the mind. And, and so this man, uh, Jesus is describing his circumstance. The Word of God is describing his location, his circumstance. He couldn't get up this man was, did not have it within himself to to get up and to to move from place to place he all it was always in need and depended on somebody else for everything he, this man was in was in terrible shape and his condition was 38 years now let, let me put that in perspective because in the bible a generation is 40 years so this man had had this infirmity almost a lifetime, an entire lifetime. Put that in, in, into your, your picture of what's occurring in the Word of God in John chapter 5. This man had dealt with this for almost his entire life, 38 years People didn't live long in the New Testament. The Old Testament, you can read early in the Old Testament, they lived up into hundreds of years, not in the New Testament. Not in the New, matter of fact, matter of fact they were, they'd be glad to read 70 in the New Testament. 
And, 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 and here this man had had 38 years of this. And he's lying at the pool of Bethesda, the house of mercy. That's what Bethesda means, the house of mercy. He had come hoping to receive mercy. And for 38, and, and the Bible says that Jesus knew he had lived, been there a long time. He understood this man didn't just show up today. He had been there. And Jesus comes to this 38-year-old veteran of sickness. 38 years, and not 38-year-old, but 38 year, years of, of sickness that he had had in his life. And he asks the question, wilt thou be made whole? Seriously, do you want to get well? I kind of, I kind of, thinking about that question, it's kind of like the question my mom used to ask me when I was a kid. Do you really want a spanking? Uh, that was the question my mom would ask me. It's kind of, I always thought it was a silly question because my, uh, my answer was not, oh, let me think about this one. It didn't matter what my answer was, did it? But, but I, I didn't have to think about it either because, no, I really didn't want to spank him. I didn't want to have to walk out in the front yard and to the switch bush. I don't know what kind of bush it was, but it was a switch bush to me. And, and break off a switch and, and come back in and mom get, lay that on the back side of my legs. I, I wasn't too thrilled about that. And this man who was laid at the pool, this man for 38 years laying at the pool, coming to the pool day in, day out, being there, waiting, waiting, waiting for the moving of the water. And I'm sure he had witnessed the water moving and somebody else getting in before him because he even described it. He even described what happened. He's, when he answered the Lord, he said, I don't have a man because when the water's troubled, somebody else beats me in. He described what had happened, so he had witnessed other people's healings. He had witnessed other miracles. He had seen all of these things happen, yet for 38 years by the pool, and the question that Jesus asked him, he didn't ask him, how you doing? He didn't ask him, uh, can I help you? Can I get you anything? Do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be? I mean, wouldn't the answer be absolutely yes? Wouldn't it be a resounding yes that, oh, absolutely, I don't even have to think about this, Jesus. Yes, I want to be made whole. Yes, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm laying here. I've been here. I keep waiting for my chance to get into the water. I'm tired of 38 years of infirmity. I'm tired of 38 years of sickness. I'm tired of 38 years of depending on somebody else to do everything for me. I'm tired of all of that, and, and, and I, I'm here. And quite honestly, some people would look at this question and say, that's a ridiculous question, considering the circumstances. Considering what was, considering the state of this man, considering the location of this man, considering that he knew he had been there 38 years some would say that question was really unnecessary. But I'm going to tell you that question was very important. It was very important. Because the moment that guy acknowledged that he wanted to be made whole, the moment that guy, that man acknowledged that he was trying to get to the water to get his miracle. That moment, that man admitted, I've got a problem. I've got a problem. I mean, obviously, for this man, it, it, it was, you could look at him and see. Obviously, it didn't take any r real deductive skills to figure out that this man was there for a miracle. I do not a, a lot of counseling, but I do some counseling with folks from time to time. 
And one of my first responsibilities when I'm, when I'm working with someone and I'm sitting in the office, one of the first things that I strive to do, and sometimes it happens immediately, but more than often than not, it does not. And, and that is trying to get to the root issue of the problem. Because often, the problem is not the problem. More often than not, what they come into the office to seek counseling for is really not the problem. It's the face of the problem. But the real problem lies deeper than, than that. So, so my responsibility in, in sitting with, with someone in the office from time to time is to try to get to the root of the issue and try to get try to get to help them and and I, with couples I've I've sat with couples before it's a little harder couples because nobody wants to admit there's a problem. We we want help to fix the symptoms. We don't want help to fix the problem. We want, to make, we want to get the symptoms all taken care of, and, and we want to make sure that that's done. And if we can get the symptoms taken care of, then the root problem will hopefully take care of itself. Don't always work that way. So when Jesus asked the man, wilt thou be made whole, this man had to admit that he was in need of a healing. He had to admit that, yes, I have got an issue. I've got a problem. Think, let's, let's think of it this way. When, when my wife and I invite you to our house, we're going to invite you in. You can come in the front door. You can stand there in the, in the foyer of the house. And then off to the left, you're, you're welcome to go into the living room. And then you can go from the living room either into the family room or into the dining room. And then once you're in the dining room, you're welcome to go on into the kitchen. And you can stay in any of those rooms as long as you want to. You're welcome to stand. You're welcome to sit. You're welcome to, to, to do whatever. You're welcome to look at whatever's in those rooms. You're, you're welcome to do that. But those are not the only rooms in our house. Those rooms don't have door, well, the family room doors, but they're, they're propped open and they're just there for looks. And, but the other rooms, they have no doors on them. And, and so you're, you're welcome to it. But there are other rooms in the house that when you walk in, the doors are going to be closed. Because I really don't want you to see whether my bed is made or not. I really don't want you to see whether I hung my clothes up from Sunday or not. And, and, and so there's, there's some rooms in the house you're not going to see because we're going to have the doors closed. And your hand, if it reaches for that doorknob, is going to get slapped. <laughs> because there's just some places in my house you're not going to go. Not because I don't love you. I just don't want you to see what's on the other side of the door. And folks, we're the same way. There are things we let people see about us. There are things that we, that we are very open about, about us, very revealing about us. But there are other things that are behind closed doors that we don't let people see. Hello. Hallelujah, amen, and glory to God. I'm on your front porch right now, aren't I? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are things that we do not reveal to other people, and we don't let people in those places. You want to know why? You want to know why we don't let people in those places? Because we think if you see that part of us, you're not going to like us anymore. You're not going to respect us anymore. If we show you that, that, that place in our life of, of who we are, that we keep behind the door. 
And, and if we open that, we're making ourselves very vulnerable. And we're just not sure that we want you to know about that because we're not sure how you'll respond. And so we keep a lot of our hurts and we keep a lot of our past and we keep a lot of our stuff and we keep a lot of our things we deal with. We keep them shut away so that you don't see them. And we know you like this part of us. We know you like the living room and the kitchen and the dining room. I'm not sure you'll like us if you see the bedroom. <laughs> and, 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 and so we, 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 put that, we put that away and we shut the door so that you don't have to deal with it and so that we don't have to deal with it. Let, let me just tell you something right now. I don't care what's behind your door. This pastor is going to love you. I, I don't care what you've hidden. I, I, I don't care what happened to you 10, 15, 20 years ago. I do care. Don't get me wrong. I care. But I'm going to love you in spite of that. This church is going to love you. Can I speak for the church right now? This church is going to love you no matter what you've got hidden back there. God is going to love you. That will never change. God's love for you cannot change. And, and God is going to love you no matter what you've allowed to get hidden. So when Jesus asked this man the question, wilt thou be made whole? I really think he would, was asking that more for us than he was for that man because it was obvious the answer for that man. It's not always obvious the answer for me and you. It's not always on display. We don't always lay by the pool of Bethesda. Not openly anyway. We don't always put ourselves in a place where everybody sees the deep things and we play the cover-up game and, and pastors up there preaching who wants to be healed and we're sitting there back, back there saying, who, me? Who, me? You, you talking to me? No, you're not talking to me. You, you, you're, not, you're not dealing with me. Not me, pastor. Not me. I've got it. Boom, boom, boom. It's all in line. I, I, I'm, all, I'm all good. I don't have a problem. But let me tell you about sister so-and-so. Because sister so-and-so, I'm telling you, she got some problems. And I, I can tell you about her. And we hide those things, and we put on our facade, and we, we make ourselves look, look good because that's what we think you want to see. But God's asking us today, wilt thou? Be made whole. Wilt thou be healed? You want to know why people are afraid of these things? You know, David wrote a psalm, Psalm 139, incredible psalm. And in the psalm, David starts off by asserting in that psalm in verse 1 and verse 2, he says, he said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising thou understandest my thought afar off he said in other words before I even think it you already know about it before it even comes in my mind you knew about it before it I, I even thought about thinking about it you, you know my down sitting, you know my weakness, you know my uprising, you know my strength, you know me. You know me. He, he goes on throughout the psalm. He says, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. And David gets to the end of the psalm and he closes with this. Now he's already, he's already written a psalm of, of 
20-some verses asserting how much God knows. Though I make my bed in hell, thou art with me, he said. Wherever I go, I cannot escape you, God. I can't get away from you. You see everything about me. But he closes the psalm with two verses. Put them up there. He, he says, after he has said, thou hast searched me and known me, he says this, search me, God. Search me, God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And then he says, and see if there be any wicked or hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. After, say, God, after asserting that God knows everything about him, he still comes to the end of the psalm and he says, Lord, search me. Because God, I've got some hidden things. Because God, I've got some you, you, you already know about them. I don't have to tell you about them. But God, I want you to know about them. See, you have to reach that point in your, in your life with God that you're willing to say, God, I'm going to open those doors. I'm going to open the doors and I'm going to let you in. And I'm going to be honest with myself. And I'm going to be honest with you. When you search me, go back to 23, when you, when you search me and you know me and, and you've tried me and, and, and you've, you, you know my thoughts, I, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, God, because there are some things that are hidden. After, I've, after, I've, after I realize you know all about me, but God, I really want to be honest with you. I really want you to search me and know these things. Because God, go to 24, because God, when you've done all of this and you've seen if there's been anything in me that's wicked, that's hurtful, that's, 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 that, that shouldn't be there, then God, I want you to lead me. Let me tell you something about, about emotional, and, and I was going to say this to the very end, but, but this verse just, just confirms what, I'm, what, I'm, what I was going to tell you. Something about emotional and, and spiritual healings. They happen over time. They take time to heal. Now, physical healings, we've seen God do like that. Miraculous, miraculous things. But emotional healings take time because, and I'll tell you why, because it takes a while for us to release those things. It's not easy for us to let go of some stuff. Some of you are looking at me like I read your diary last night. That's why he said, lead me. Where do you lead somebody? If I told you today, right now, if I told you, Sister Patty, to walk to Charleston, and you would so willingly do that, and you would get up, and you would walk out the door, and you would head up here to Route 2, and then whichever way you would choose to go, and would you be there in an hour? No. No, I don't, I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't be to Ripley in an hour. And, but the thing is, I may not be there in an hour, but if I keep walking, if I keep putting one step in front of the other, I'm going to get there. If I just, if I just keep going and, and not stop, then my destination is going to be Charleston because I'll make it eventually. And when the Lord is leading us, in the way everlasting. It's putting one foot in front of the other, one step in front of the other, so that eventually we can get to that place of being made whole. I think sometimes we get frustrated in the process. We get frustrated in, in the process of getting from here to Charleston. We get hot, starts raining, whatever. 
Something happens along the way, and we get frustrated. And, and, and so we, we're, we're dealing with that, and sometimes we end up stopping before we get there. And we think God hasn't healed us, but the fact is we didn't follow through. We didn't keep going. We didn't allow God to do what God does and to heal us and, and to lead us in, in the way everlasting. But sometimes, folks, we got to be willing to open up those hidden things to God. We, we, we've got to be willing to say, God, search me, know me, and, and, and allow God to work. Lord, I've been living behind a wall, but the wall's coming down. I, I, I've been hiding in the corner, but God, I, I, I'm coming out of the corner. So you got to admit, yes, I've got, some, I've got some doors closed in my life, and there's some things that, God, I need you to heal. I have some things I need you to fix. So we have to be honest with God. We have to do that. But there's also in the answer, because when this man answered, put John 5, 7 up. When this man answered, he said, sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. If I could tell you how many times I've sat in my office with my wife and we've sat in there with someone and we've tried to help them and they did the exact same thing that this man did. They did the exact same thing because they started telling us why it couldn't happen. They started telling us why they couldn't be healed. I mean, can you hear a little bit of woe is me in that? Can, can you hear a, bit, a little bit about why do bad things always happen to me? In what this man said? Why, why is it the eyes that I always end up um, with, with the bad stuff and everybody else gets their blessing? Everybody else gets their, gets their, but here I am. I'm still laying here. Matter of fact, I'm no closer to the pool today than I was 10 years ago. And here I, here I am laying here. Folks, we got to be careful. We, we got to be careful that we don't let life's tribulations become the irritant in our wound. We, we've got to be careful that we don't start making excuses for the problem and trying to defend the problem. This man was blaming somebody else, and that's what we love to do that. It's not my fault, man. It's not my fault. Eve did it. Eve ate of the apple. Wasn't me, God. Wasn't me. Eve, Eve took the apple, and I, I just stood there and watched. Wasn't my fault. We, we do that. And, and we start making excuses for the problem. And, and, and Jesus' response was wonderful. He didn't say, okay, go somebody, get somebody to help you. He didn't defend the man's issue. He didn't, matter of fact, he didn't even acknowledge the man's, pro, the, the man's response. He did not even acknowledge that the man had, had, had tried to defend his problem and had to, tried to defend why he'd been like this all, all this time and so forth. Jesus looks at him and says, rise up, take up thy bed and walk. He didn't even, um, uh, Sister Johnson, I wonder how, uh, what would happen if we sat in our office and when people start making excuses, we just, we just ignored their excuses. We, we would just not even acknowledge that, that, that they, they, they come up with all this stuff that defends their problem because, quite honestly, in their mind, they, 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 they're stuck there. They're stuck, and so they've got to defend a reason they're stuck. They've got to find a reason they're stuck. And, and, and so they, they, they get in that situation, but Jesus looks at this man and says, rise. He tells him to do something. His first word is a verb, an action word. 
Buddy, you want to be made whole, you got to do something about it. Oh, hello. We're, I'm still here. I'm still here. You haven't fired me yet. <laughs> you got to do something. You got to get up, young man. You got you to gotta be willing to deal with this. Rise, take up thy bed and walk. Don't expect somebody else. <laughs> Don't expect somebody else to fix it for you. Oh, my. You all didn't come expecting this today, did you? This man literally went from, I can't. I can't get better. I mean, that's what he was saying. In his response to Jesus, wilt thou be made whole? I can't. I don't have anybody else to help me. I don't, I don't, ha I don't have, nobody's going to uh, get me down there. I, I, I'm going to watch everybody else get their miracle, but I can't. I can't. I can't, I, I can't do it. I can't get better. I can't have victory. I can't do this. I can't do that. I, I can't. I, I, I can't. Let me tell you, you don't serve a God of can't. You don't serve a God of can't. That, that's not in what God. Matter of fact, what did I tell you last Sunday? God cannot fail. God can't. It's impossible for God to fail. He cannot fail. It reminds me of the prodigal. Well, in the story of the prodigal, got discontent in the father's house, started looking down the road. Started smelling the smell of the world and sin, and God pulled him out, and he, he, asked his, he asked his father for his inheritance, and he left and went and spent everything, he ends up in the, in the pig pen, and he's starving to death, and the Bible says he come to himself, and the first thing he said is, I will arise. I will arise. He didn't ask for somebody to help him. He didn't ask for somebody to, to try to uh, coax him. You just be my cheerleader, coax me on, help, help me, help me get that. Oh, I will arise. I'm taking responsibility for where I'm at. I will arise, and I will go to my father's house. I've got to, folks, the, res the recipe for the miracle in your life is being willing to take responsibility that you got a problem and being willing to do something about it. Now, God had to do something in the man's legs because the man had been 38 years laying. His, his, his legs had no strength in them. His muscles, I'm sure, had, what's that word? At atrophy? Is that the right word? Atrophy? And, 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 and uh, I, am I, correct me if I'm wrong, Brother Darren, because you're the man that would know that man laying there more than likely, his bones have become brittle from lack of use over time. Would that be also true? And, and so this man, this man had a lot against him as far as getting up. There were a whole lot of things that, that were against him in receiving his miracle. And the condition he was in, his infirmity, his disease, all of that. But first he had to be willing to do something about it. But if he was willing to do something about it, then God was willing to do something about it. And when he started to arise, the strength would start coming into his legs. The muscles would heal. The bones would heal. All of that would take place because this man admitted he needed help and he was willing to arise. Yeah. Hallelujah. I'm telling you today that God wants to heal you. He wants to heal you. But the question is, wilt thou be made whole? Jesus looked at the man with the withered hand. Remember that? The man with the withered hand in the temple, he came in. And as a matter of fact, he hit his hand when he came in because you weren't allowed to enter the temple if, if you had a problem like that. But yet this man came in and, and uh, Jesus said, told him to step forth. And the man had to step forth. And then he said, stretch forth. You stretch forth. Stretch forth your hand. And when he stretched it forth, 
It was made whole as the other hand because he was willing to do something about it. He was willing to receive his healing. I'm, I'm out of time. I'm running out of time. But I'm telling you today that the two things that's going to help you get your healing is you've got to open those doors. You've got to be willing to admit, I've got some stuff back here. I've been hurt before, preacher. I've been hurt, and it, I didn't deserve it. No, you didn't deserve it. And, but but you got to deal with it, and you got you got to let God help you get over it. you got to Help God help you fix it. And you got to be willing to arise. You got to be willing to, st to stretch forth. You got to be willing to admit you have a problem and willing to do something about it. Stand with me. I got to quit. I'm so far over time. But I'm talking about being recovered. Being recovered from, from the things that happen to us because they're going to happen to us. Jesus said, we shall have tribulation. Jesus said, you shall be offended. You will be offended. Offense will come. I'd love to say that God, when God filled us with the Holy Ghost, he put us in a bubble, and none of this stuff could get to us, but that's not true. That's not true. Because it rains on the... And the, and the unjust. It rains. And we've got to admit, I've got some stuff back, back there in the back, Pastor. I've stored it for a long time. I've been lying here 38 years. I've come to the pool. I've come to church every Sunday. But i got stuff lying back there. And I've kept the door closed. And I need a healing. I need a healing. I need God to lead me into a healing, into the way everlasting. Lord Jesus, I pray right now. God, over this congregation on this Sunday morning, Oh, God, in your holy name, I pray right now, God, that you touch and minister. God, in this congregation, Lord, we do ask you today, search us. Search us, O oh God. Know us. Try our hearts, God. Lord, search for those things that, God, we've never dealt with. Search for those things, God, we've never admitted. Search for those things in our life, God, that, Lord, we've kept behind closed doors. And, God, deny it today. We open the door for your healing. We open the door, God, and let you see what's there. We open the door, God, for you to touch us. God,